The Joy and Humor of the Saints Excerpts from The Bedside Book of Saints by Father Aloysius Roche Neil Obstadt, Thomas McLaughlin, Imprimatur Joseph Butt, 1934 Chapter 1 The Human Nature of the Saints It is comforting to know that in all the saints there is quite enough of the human element to give a human interest to the story of their lives. History exhibits to us plenty of heroes who had very little humanity and some who had none at all. The poet Shelley once said rather inelegantly, You might as well go to a gin shop for a leg of mutton as expect anything human from me. But the servants of God are not of that sort. They are very complete men and women, and this is one of the sources of their great attraction. We like to find ordinary things, even in extraordinary people. We like to find weakness, even in those who are strong. A marble and bronze type of heroism excites our astonishment, but it leaves our heart rather cold. Christian heroism, however, dwells in the heart of flesh. So far from destroying the innocent weaknesses of our nature, sanctity finds in them its strength and its beauty. We may be sure that the fathers of the desert, the anchorites and the solitaries, all felt the wild bird's thrill of song behind the bars, and that the cloisters and the hermitages, even in the most strenuous ages of monastic penance, were not peopled by phantoms, but by human beings like ourselves, speaking, thinking, and feeling as we do, fed with the same food, hurt with the same weapons, subject to the same diseases, healed by the same means, and warmed and cooled by the same summer and winter. Who would have ever had suspected that St. Anthony the Hermit was one of the most sociable of men? Yet St. Athanasius tells us that he was. It is only too true that many of the saints appear to us to be very shadowy. This may be the fault or the misfortune of their biographers, who either do not or cannot tell us what they were really like or are, so intent on exhibiting their supernatural virtues that they have forgotten or thrown into the shade the natural elements. Besides, the saints resemble a rich landscape or a work of art. They require to be studied. We do not take them in at a glance or even at first sight. Some reveal themselves more rapidly than others, but some of them seem to wear a look of reserve in their faces, and to know them takes time. The very name of St. Dominic suggests something formidable. We think of the dog with the lighted torch in its mouth. We think of the terrible hammer of the Albigensians. It surprises us to find St. Dominic in his weary journey across the Alps, carrying in his pack some wooden spoons as a pleasant surprise for the nuns in Rome who were his very good friends. Again, St. John of the Cross has been called the inflexible saint and the impenetrable saint. Some of his writings convey the impression of a man buried within himself, walled up as in a sepulcher, and looking out to the world of sense with blood-stained and terrible eyes. But the letters which pass between himself and St. Teresa show plainly that he was nothing of the kind. If there had not been a very human side to St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa could have never teased him as she was in the habit of doing, or have found a nickname for him and chosen it from amongst the pagan philosophers. St. Ignatius, too, appears the distant horizon as a figure rigid and unbending. But the character of St. Ignatius is full of the most delightful and attractive traits. He could dance, and he did once dance. He could play billiards, and he did play once for a wager and won. He was so fond of flowers that he would never pluck them. Behind the failure of biography and behind the haze which always gathers about the distant past, we can be certain to find that human nature of ours which is pretty much the same in all men and in every age. St. Aloysius, in spite of all impressions to the contrary, must have been a most attractive person, considering that he completely won the heart of a man like St. Robert Bellarmine. The great charm of the old monastic chronicles lies in this, that they are human documents. They unfold before our eyes, indeed, a spiritual drama, but they enable us to see that the actors in it are real men with the passions and weaknesses of men. 
albeit those same men are quite evidently making great efforts to become saints. Again, the martyrdoms of the early church somehow or other present themselves to our imaginations as things statuesque or even e ethereal. We know that St. Polycarp and St. Sebastian were men, and we know that St. Agnes and St. Cecilia were women. But we fancy, for some reason, that the man or the woman in them was completely sublimated by the sheer ecstasy and exaltation of their sacrifice. Yet the English martyrs were the same sort of martyrs as those of the Colosseum, and the acts of the English martyrs show how surprisingly human they were. Indeed, St. Perpetua's description of herself, as recorded in her own acts, is a very human description. She tells us how she was sitting at table when her family, when the officers of the crown came to remove her to prison. How in prison? I was terrified, for I had never been in such darkness before. We suffered greatly from the heat and from the insolence of the jailers. And what gave me most pain was that I hadn't my baby with me. When her father came and on his knees begged her to take pity on his gray hairs and submit to the emperor, quote, I was ready to die of grief to see him in such a state. Besides the characters of the saints, like that of all great people, were many sided and even the best biography may stress one side at the expense of another. Perhaps this explains how it happens that a dozen biographies of the same saint may appear within the space of a few years, each one bringing to light something which the other has overlooked. In the Middle Ages, there were 66 different lives of St. Patrick in circulation at one and the same time. In our day, we have new lives constantly appearing, and each one is hailed as an improvement on its predecessor. In the life of St. Margaret Mary, published by the visitation of Pere Le Moniel, reference is made to the erroneous ideas concerning the saint which have been fostered by her biographers and those erroneous ideas nearly all relate to the human side of St. Margaret Mary. How unjust it would be to describe St. Jane Francis de Chantel as the mother who stepped over the prostrate body of her son, or St. Paula as the mother who sailed away to the east, leaving her distracted children on the shore, or St. Aloysius as the youth who never looked at his mother's face, and so on. The truth is, is that all these saints had very affectionate and tender hearts, and whatever sacrifices they made, they suffered most intensely in making them. St. Ignatius stood up to his neck in a frozen pond. St. Benedict rolled in thorns. St. Jerome struck his breast with a heavy stone. Blessed Angela of Folgelino branded herself with a red-hot iron. These are incidents in the lives of the saints but they are not the sufficient keys to the characters of the saints. Merely to know that they did such things is not to know them. The value of such incidents lies in this, that they do reveal to us that the saints had to wrestle with the same human problem of sin and temptation which daily confronts ourselves. It sometimes happens that accounts of the extreme and extraordinary leave half of the story untold. For example, St. John Chabita, the solitary, is cited as an instance of the length to which the old-time aesthetics carry the spirit of self-abnegation. Having spent six years in the desert, he was given leave to return home. On the way, he disguised himself as a beggar and, not being recognized, was driven by his mother from his mother's door. He then went to live in a little hut nearby, preserving meanwhile the secret of his identity. This is the story of St. John Chalbata, but it is not by any means the whole story. The sequel is this. After three years our Lord appeared to him, telling him that his penance was over and bidding him reveal himself to his mother. Overjoyed, the saint sends for her, tells her everything, and later dies in her arms. We know nothing of St. Simeon Silites except that he lived on a pillar, yet Probably he laughed heartily at himself sometimes, as did St. Teresa. My health is very bad, but God does so much through me that I laugh heartily at myself. At any rate, one of the pillar solitaries has left behind quite an amusing account of his experiences. And moreover, we gather that St. Simeon himself was a man of very sound common sense. He approached his experiment with great caution and cunning. For some years, he tried himself out, so to say, on small pillars, 
until he came to be able to do 50 feet without feeling it. We also know that there was no fanaticism or eccentricity about him because, at a word from authority, he was prepared to pack his experiment up and put it away. Yes, the character of the saints was many-sided, and Saint Teresa of Avila is a very good example of it. She was impetuous and hasty, and yet cool, calculating and businesslike. She was simple, and she was extremely shrewd. She would give the poor anything they wanted, and yet woe to the tradesmen who tried any of his business tricks with her convent. She was susceptible to indignation and natural aversions. When Prioress Beatrix was in disgrace, she couldn't bear to hear her name mentioned. And yet, she had a most affectionate, exuberant, and even playful temperament. A recent writer compares her to a stainless but metallic lily, forged or wrought iron. Those who suffer, he says, have scant consolation to expect from her. This was the impression made upon him by reading her works. How different, however, is the impression of her letters. Here is revealed the sympathy, pity, and truly maternal tenderness of this mother of the church, and above all here is revealed the real woman. She speaks freely of her aches and pains, likes and dislikes, vexations and antipathies, pokes fun at the Inquisition, invents nicknames for her friends and enemies, and, womanlike, excuses her bad writing by blaming the pen. The butter tasted very nice, as it was sure to be coming from you. So I accept it on condition that you remember me when you have any more that is particularly fine, as it does me a great deal of good. The quinces, too, were delicious. In fact, it seems to me as though you had nothing else to do except give me pleasure, St. Teresa of Avila said. It is doubtful if so much human nature was ever compressed into so small a letter. That they suffered, and were apparently glad to suffer, is no sign that they did not feel. Let me suffer or die, prayed one of them. The little flower did not know how she would ever become, said he would be lucky to be read of a quarter of an hour before his death. How irascible St. Francis de Sales was by nature. What a stiff battle he had to fight in order to master his temper. He was quite frank in telling us that the passion of anger was uncommonly strong in him and that he had to exert himself to the utmost in order to keep it down. The faults of St. Gertrude were so notorious that St. Mackildide actually asked our Lord why he was able to love her so much. St. Francis of Assisi, who did ever pay the highest heed that never should he be a hypocrite before God, make no secret of his temptations, and he confessed to his brethren that he felt vainglorious as often as he gave an alms. This simplicity is, in fact, one of the great notes of God's servants, and it means that they never played a part, never pretended to be other than they were, never countenance the pretenses and poses of the worldly. It means, in short, that they were above all real and genuine, that is to say natural and human. Affectation was St. Philip Neri's pet aversion. How candid and engaging are the confessions of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. She tells us about her aversions and repugnances, admits that searching in books for beautiful prayers made her headache, and that in the morning she felt no courage or strength for the practicing of virtue. She was on the point of showing her annoyance to the sister who splashed her with the dirty water in the laundry. She was sorely tried by the fidgeting of her neighbor at meditation, and the effort she made to restrain her impatience cost me so much that I was bathed in perspiration. Or there is Claire Vaughan on her deathbed. It is all very well to say, courage, Claire, courage, when one only sees paradise through a little hole. And here is what the mirror of perfection tells us of the last days of St. Francis of Assisi. Whilst he was sick of the ailment from which he died, he one day called his companion saying, you know how Lady Jacqueline of Satosili was and is exceedingly devoted unto me, and I do therefore believe that she would hold it a great consolation were we to notify her of mine estate, and specially send her word that she send me of the marshapan that many a time she hath made for me in the city. This marshapan, or marzipan, was a confection of almonds and sugar, and sure enough it was sent for and it came, 
although it happened to be on the way in any case. Chapter 2 The Joy of the Saints St. Francis of Assisi bade his followers leave sadness to the devil. St. Leonard of Port Maurice did not go quite so far. Leave sadness, he said, to those in the world. We who work for God should be light-hearted. The poor world must be rather annoyed at receiving a legacy of this sort. Certainly, worldly people would be very astonished to hear sadness described as their prerequisite and monopoly. In its own obstinate way, the world persists in associating the fervent practice of religion with the features and furniture of the undertaker. Surely religion was never meant to make people miserable. This is the sort of half-question that is put to us over and over again. And like the man who was asked if he had stopped beating his wife, we hesitate between yes and no. To cast us down in order to raise us up is certainly one of the functions of religion. And apart from this, there will, no doubt, always be those who insist upon making themselves unhappy about religion. Religion, like every other blessing, must be approached in the right spirit and handled in the right way. But since, as St. Thomas says, happiness is the natural life of man, and since religion is intended to enrich our natural life and not to impoverish it, I am come that you may have life and may have it more abundantly, it follows, because it must follow, that religion aims at expanding and not suppressing the joy de vere that is in us. St. Madeline Sophie wrote in one of her letters, If the world knew our happiness, it would, out of a sheer envy, invade our retreats, and the times of the fathers of the desert would return when the solitudes were more populous than the cities. It is always springtime in the heart that loves God, the curie of ours declared, and he spoke from experience. St. Philip Neri also insisted on this. At table, on a feast day, he started a discussion on joy. Each guest had to give an opinion. No doubt, the saint playfully observed. Bereno will tell us that Christian gladness springs from constant meditation on death. His own opinion, however, was this. Christian joy is a gift of God flowing from a good conscience. The soul of one who serves God, says St. John of the Cross, always swims in joy, always keeps holiday, and is always in a mood for singing. The tidings of our religion are tidings of great joy. Your hearts shall rejoice, our Lord said, and your joy no man shall take from you. Doubtless the Holy Ghost still dwells in his church, and joy is one of his gifts. He is the inspiration of all holy lives. Sanctity can be learnt only in his school, and therefore joy is one of the notes of sanctity. Un saint triste est un triste saint. A saint who is sad is indeed a sad sort of saint. In Holy Scripture, it is just the man who is told to feast and rejoice before God and be God delighted with gladness. Be glad in the Lord, ye just, and glory, all ye right of heart. Laugh and grow strong is one of the sayings of St. Ignatius. I see you are always laughing, he says to Francis Coster. I am glad of it, and while you are faithful to your rule, you cannot be too happy. St. Teresa, as we have seen, prayed to be delivered from sour-faced saints. I will have no sadness amid the thorns of life, St. Catherine of Ricci said, but only manly patience. I will have no sadness in my house, St. Philip Neri declared, and he kept his word, for we are told, Philip's room is not a room, but a paradise. He was a great an enemy of sadness and trouble as he was a friend of peace and joy. Thus, the Bishop of Belle writes of St. Francis de Sales. In the very best sense, the saints made the most of both worlds. He was one of the happiest men that I ever met, is Erasmus's description of St. Thomas More. Let nothing affright thee, is the motto recommended by St. Teresa. We do not find the saints snarling at life or indulging in sullenness against nature. They did not indeed shut their eyes to the evils of our existence here below. 
They accepted life as they found it without expecting to get from it either more than it could give or less. Defective they knew it to be, but they believed that something can be done to make it better and happier, and that something they tried their best to do. The poisonous weed of pessimism has never taken root in Catholic soil. The solitaries certainly interpreted the evangelical precepts very strictly, and they made very heroic efforts to put them in practice. Go sell what thou hast and give it to the poor and follow me. This text sent thousands of them into the desert, but it is related of St. Anthony, their patriarch, that devout pilgrims flocked out in crowds and sought his cell in order to look at his face, which, in the extremity of old age, reflected the joy and gladness of his soul. St. Francis gave a very literal interpretation to the text, Call no one father but God, and yet it has been said that the sun has never really shone over Assisi since he died. He apparently infected the very air with the spirit of joy, and the echoes of his singing still resound in the hills and valleys of Umbria. I have learnt the lesson of unbelief, Goeth lamented, I have lost faith in the world. But the saints never lost faith even in this world. St. Vincent de Paul approached more closely than most men to the sordid and the seamy side of life, and yet the very sight of his face always made the beholder happy, and the last word that he ever spoke, confido, is the watchword of an optimist. St. Dominic's life's work was to fight the battle of faith against those who had lost the faith, but he never lost faith even in human nature. An early life of him says that his face was always joyous and people ran after him as he walked through the street. Even death, that most terrifying thing in human experience, could not shake the confidence and serenity of the saints. By another curious paradox, death is commonly most feared by those who steadily refuse to entertain the thought of it. Dr. Johnson, strong-minded man though he was, found the prospect very terrifying. The whole life, he maintained, is but keeping away the thoughts of death. Perhaps this was his mistake. Skulls as dinner table decorations we certainly do not relish at all. But they may have served a more practical purpose than we think. At any rate, the undeniable fact remains that the saints, who constantly lived in the presence of death, feared it not at all. The perfect love of God, said St. John of the Cross, makes death welcome and most sweet to the soul. When the poor clares of Amiens, who were hiding in during the French Revolution, were caught and thrown into prison, Sister St. Joseph said, Hurrah! We shall all go straight to paradise. They were not guillotined, however, no doubt greatly to Sister St. Joseph's disappointment. I suffer much but I am an astonishing peace. I am full of confidence. This was how the little flower talked of her deathbed. Brother Elias rebuked St. Francis of Assisi for singing on his deathbed. He ought rather to be thinking of death, he said. But of course, that is exactly what he was doing, and so he sang. Did not the Carmelite martyrs of Compagnon sing the litany of Loreto on the scaffold? The poor man of Assisi had nothing of this world to leave behind him, but he did bequeath to his followers that spirit of joy. He wished them to be the troubadours of God. One of their number, Jacopone de Todi, went further and became God's jester. Since something of the real portrait is found in every caricature, it may be that the irreverent legend of the jolly friar is based upon the gaiety and light-heartedness of St. Francis and his first disciples. The saints knew that efforts to be permanent must be joyful efforts, that without great courage and an unshaken confidence we shall find it very difficult to persevere. A glad spirit, St. Philip used to say, attains to perfection more quickly than any other. Anxiety and bitterness, wrote St. Francis de Sales, are the ruin of devotion. And here is St. Clair. Melancholy is the poison of devotion. When one is in tribulation, it is necessary to be more happy and more joyous because one is nearer to God. The cylinder of Nabonibus 
the father of Belshazzar, which dates from the year 555 BC, has at least one very Christian sentiment expressed in the form of a prayer. Give me, O God, a great joy in order that I may serve thee the better. It is because our Lord demands great sacrifices from his servants that he compensates and fortifies them with the spirit of joy. The measure of our joy is the measure of our generosity. The founders of great religious orders gave a variety of shapes to the institutions which they established, but they were all at one in asserting the melancholy must be banished from the cloister. St. John Chrysostom, the earliest biographer the monks had, said of them, They have no sadness. They wage war on the devil, as though they were amusing themselves, or, as the original expresses it, as though they were performing a dance. Perhaps we are inclined to take the devil too seriously. What is all this talk I hear about the devil? St. Teresa of Avila used to say. He flies from a drop of holy water, said St. Francis de Sales. And Teresa Higginson maintained that the devil just wants to be noticed. It is best to pay as little attention to him as possible. Our own St. Anselm said of the monks of his day, they fill the world with their songs of joy, and yet the foolish world will have it that melancholy is the royal road that leads to the cloister. True, there is one saint whom disappointment and love drove to a convent. St. Hyacintha of Marsicati was no doubt meant to be the exception that proves the rule. What charming and delightful names those religious gave to the places where they built their monasteries the bright place, the happy meadow, the gate of heaven. There was one in Spain near Burgos which was called the Delights and one in France called the Bird's Nest. Two abbeys bore the name of Joy, a Cistercian monastery and Avernias was called Consolation and our own Netley was Joyous Place and the people who inhabited these places were so delighted with them that they often reproached themselves for it. When Alakun left his cloister to go to the court of Charlemagne, he addressed it a very touching farewell. O oh, my cell, I shall never see thee more. I shall see no more the woods which surround thee, nor the gardens which the lily mingles like ourselves, sing matins in praise of their creator. And he adds, it is thou, O Christ, and thy love, which has filled our hearts and made them glad. Thou, our glory, our life, and our salvation. Chapter 3 The Wit and Humor of the Saints Someone said, Good humor is nine-tenths of Christianity. Of course it is not, nor anything like it. This is a smart saying, whose value lies not in the saying, but in the smartness. But a sense of humor has an important part to play in the spiritual life. Father Benson did not hesitate to call St. Teresa's gift of humor a divine gift. Wisdom is from above, and it is the gift of the Holy Ghost, and humor is part and parcel of wisdom. Humor is the salt of life, and to some extent it is the salt of the religious life, preserving it from decay. G. K. Chesterton says of St. Francis of Assisi, the sense of humor salts all his escapades. The history of many of the heresies is largely a history of the breakdown of the sense of humor. Their aberrations and absurdities can, apart from the devil, hardly be accounted for otherwise. Laugh and grow strong, St. Ignatius said, and to one of his novices, I see you are always laughing, and I am glad of it. It is significant, surely, that one of the most common sense saints was distinguished by a playful wit and a keen sense of the humorous. Whoever ventured to pray as St. Teresa prayed, from silly devotions and from sour-faced saints, good Lord, deliver us. May heaven preserve you from being a Latinist, she writes to a nun who was rather fond of classical quotations. In her introduction to the interior castle, she observes, so many books have been written by learned and holy men that there is nothing left for a woman to write about. When she was asked to give her opinion on a memorandum written by Signor Sosado, this was her comment. 
Senor Salcedo never stops repeating through his whole of his paper, as St. Paul says, as the Holy Spirit says, and then he ends by regretting that he has written nothing but nonsense. I am going to denounce him to the Inquisition. On a certain journey she made in company with some priests and nuns, a halt was made for the siesta. They all sat together under the arch of a bridge, and she kept up their spirits by telling funny stories. She was fond of sending verses to Father Gratian in order to make him laugh. She invented nicknames, and very clever ones, for those whom she had dealings. The nuncia was Mathusalem, the Kaust Carmelites were the cats and the owls, and of course the discalced were the eagles and the butterflies. She herself was sometimes poor Angela, and sometimes Laurentia. She has explained the motive of it all. What would become of our little house if each one of you hid the little wit you possess? And in another letter she writes, We are having great joy here, but we do not get tipsy. What wit that man had, wrote René Bazan of the Curie of Ars. The Abbe Tonconier sympathized with him in the vexations and sufferings he endured at the hands of the devil. One gets used to everything, even to the devil, said the Curie. The Grappen and I are almost comrades. He asked the garrulous lady if there was any mouth in the year in which she talked less than usual except February. And when a priest asked permission to say Mass in his church, Father, he replied, I only regret that it is not Christmas Day so that you might say three. I have never kept waiting, not even at the Vatican, a great lady said to him. Perhaps not, madame, but nevertheless you will have to wait here. What must I do to get into heaven? asked the lady, of very ample proportions. Three lengths, my daughter. A nun said to him, People believe that you are very ignorant, father. Nevertheless, I shall always be able to teach you more than you will ever be able to learn. He used to say of the crinoline, which was the fashion of in his day, our emperor has done many fine things, but there is something he has overlooked. He should have had all doors widened by law to admit the passage of the crinoline. And when he saw on the wall of the chateau a portrait of a lady in an evening dress, one would think, he said, that she was going to the guillotine. Cardinal Capuchelletro says of St. Philip Neri, there was one feature in his character which never fails to fascinate the young. He was always mirthful and humorous. Like all the Florentines of his time, he was noted for a vein of pleasantry. I eat little, he said once, because I do not want to grow fat like our friend Francesco Scarletti. He was a vegetarian, and if, when walking with his friends, a butcher's cart passed by, he would say, Thank God I don't eat any of that stuff. St. Thomas Aquinas has somewhere a good word in favor of practical joking, and, as we shall see, St. Philip was greatly attracted to the practice. As has been remarked of St. Francis of Assisi, the sense of humor salts all of his escapades. After lodging for a time at the house of Cardinal Leo, he was beaten by devils, and he declared, that this was his punishment for consorting with cardinals. Legends relate that when he sought an interview with the Sultan of Egypt with the object of converting him, a trap was laid for him. The Sultan ordered a carpet covered with crosses to be spread on the floor of the tent. If he walks on it, I shall accuse him of insulting his god. If he does not, I shall accuse him of insulting me. Francis, of course, walked on the carpet, and on being charged with his impiety, he answered, You must know our Lord died between two thieves who also hung on crosses. We Christians have the true cross, but the crosses of the thieves we leave to you, and on these I am not ashamed to tread on. True or not, this story proves that St. Francis was commonly credited with a very nimble wit. There is wit and humor in the letters of even St. Jerome. He wrote to the wife of Toxosius, whose grandfather was a pagan and a priest of Jupiter, and whose conversion they were all anxious about. 
I am persuaded that Jupiter himself might have converted to Christianity if he had had such an alliance and family as yours. Playfulness of wit is a very striking feature of our own English martyrs. Indeed, it is surprising how full the acts of their martyrdom are of the evidences of it. Of course, St. Thomas More is conspicuous amongst them all, and he has rather eclipsed the others. His sense of the humorous never deserted him right up to the moment of his execution. Assist me up, he said to the lieutenant of the tower. Coming down, I will look after myself. The venerable passionist Father Dominic, who received Blessed Newman into the church, and who was in all things a most mortified man, permitted a very liberal indulgence to his sense of humor. His biography records many of his witty sayings. When a certain pious lady consulted him about her nocturnal visions, he proceeded to cross-examine her about the kind and quantity of wine she was in the habit of drinking at supper. We have this in one of the letters of St. Madeline Sophie. Our society has not been established to prove that women can become men, even though that may be less difficult in a country, France, where so many men become women. In a letter to Posidius, St. Augustine discusses the propriety of married women painting their faces. He is inclined to condemn it as being a form of deceit, and he adds, I am quite certain that even their own husbands do not want to be so taken in. And there is St. Jane Francis de Chantal, a young man whose fiancée had entered her convent in order to become a nun, came in, a great rage, and gave her a good telling off. When the stormy interview was over, St. Jane said, I have never listened to a panegyric which gave me greater pleasure. There is plenty of delicate humor even in the autobiography of St. Therese the Little Flower, and there is evidence that had little Anne de Guillon lived, she would have developed along the same lines. We are told that when she was six, she received a beautiful doll as a compensation for losing her first tooth. Of course, her brother, Jacques, promptly broke the doll. Anne at first was very angry, and then, pulling herself together with an effort, she said to the governess, It is better so. I can make the sacrifice of Abraham. Soon after his conversion, St. Ignatius was imprisoned by the Inquisition, and on being examined was accused of teaching novelties. My lord, he answered, I should not have thought it had been any novelty to speak Christ to Christians. The same playful humor was characteristic of St. Francis de Sales. A religious complained to him that his new superior was even worse than the old. Instead of a horse, we now have an ass. But said the saint, was not Balaam well instructed by an ass? He rebuked an acquaintance for making fun of a hunchback. The works of God are perfect, he said. What? Perfect and yet deformed? Yes, perhaps he is a perfect hunchback. In conversation, and even in the pulpit, he was fond of telling amusing stories. For example, a certain woman who was always making a point of contradicting her husband fell into a river and was drowned. The husband, in dragging for the body, went upstream instead of down. When the bystanders pointed out to him that the current must surely have carried it lower down, his answer was, Do you imagine that even her dead body could do anything except contradict me? When busybodies took liberties with his good Dave, he would say, I hear so-and-so has been clipping my beard for me, but still God somehow seems to make it grow again. This reminds me of the beard of St. Thomas More, which he protected from the act, saying, At any rate, my beard has committed no treason. During the preaching of Lent at Ansi, one of the missionaries had been letting himself go in denunciation of the absentees. St. Francis never cared for that sort of thing any more than he cared for long-winded sermons. Whom was he aiming at? he asked afterwards. He abused us for a fault which we had not committed since we were present. Did he want us to split ourselves up into pieces to fill the seats which were empty? And this wit and humor of the saints is very instructive. It reminds us of what we are apt to forget, of what we sometimes do not even suspect, that there is more real joy in a saint's life than there is in all the intoxication of worldliness. All that comes from God is joyous, 
and holiness come straight from him, is in fact the only attribute of his that man can imitate. Piety in the saints is blended with all that is light-hearted and exhilarating. Fulbert of Chartres describes the monastic spirit as a blend of natural simplicity and angelic hilarity. That is to say, the saints have some of the liveliness of the angels. It has been said of religious people, with some truth, that for one who makes piety attractive, there are nine who makes it repulsive. The saints, at any rate, are always good advertisements of religion. They uphold and exhibit the bright side of devotion and preach the lesson of the joyful service of God. Where there is a great deal of faith, there will always be a great deal of laughter. England was Merry England when she was full of faith, and Chesterton maintains that the English people have not laughed heartily since the Middle Ages. Humor has been called the fountain of reconciliation and well-being which smiling and indulgent contemplates the world with a kindly eye. It was the union in them of this natural gift with the supernatural gift of faith that produced the optimism of the saints. Chapter 4 The Cheerfulness of the Saints True piety is cheerful as the day. This truthful line we owe, strangely enough, to one of the saddest and most melancholy of our poets, Copper. Since there is no doubt about the piety of the saints, there can be no doubt about their cheerfulness. St. Peter of Alcantara said of St. Teresa, With all her sanctity, she always appeared cheerful and agreeable. Another early biography says, Her very looks had such a charm that they soothed and rejoiced those who approached her. This is the glad heart which maketh a cheerful countenance, of which Holy Scripture speaks. Indeed, we may be sure that there never was and never will be any such thing as a depressing sort of saint. The word melancholy has been used in connection with St. Margaret Mary, but we know now that this has been a mistake. Penitents many of the saints were, like St. Mary Magdalene and St. Mary of Egypt. Into the desert they went carrying with them the memory of their sins, and, filled with the knowledge of God's goodness to their own souls, they mortified themselves perhaps excessively. But they were well aware that our Lord said to the man in the gospel, Be of good heart, son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Some of them, like St. Pacomus and St. Anthony, fled from the corruption of their age, and in caves and on the tops of mountains sought to escape the seductions of the fallen world. But they did not forget that our Lord had said, Have confidence, I have overcome the world. Some, like St. Gregory the Great and St. Catherine of Siena, threw themselves into very thankless and heartbreaking tasks, but they made no mistake about the kind master they were serving, a master who said to his servants, It is I, fear not. For these very words our Lord cheered the heart of St. Teresa in the midst of the slanders and vexations which tried her. Fear not, daughter, it is I. I will not forsake thee. Do not fear. We complain of our environment, and no doubt we have some right to complain. But the environment of some of the saints was far more depressing than ours. St. Catherine of Siena lived at a time when the church was in a most depressing condition, and yet she never lost her good spirits. St. Philip Neri was famed for a serene and sunny cheerfulness of disposition, yet his whole life was passed in the midst of the evils of the Reformation. St. Teresa herself passed through many bitter experiences and was in some ways as sorely tried as any saint we know, and, apparently, they escape the depression which we associate with overwork. It fatigues the minds to listen to St. Paul's account of his labors and journeying, yet it is this same highly strung and sorely wrought man who tells us that God loves the cheerful giver. It is well known that the heroism of the saints was often unsuspected by their generation. They were adepts at the art of concealment. As deceivers and yet true, as known and yet unknown. St. Francis of Assisi possessed nothing at all, and yet he had the air and manner of a man who owned half the district, as having nothing, yet possessing all things. 
Saint Teresa used to attribute the good opinion people had of her, her own, to her own cunning and hypocrisy. This, of course, was her humility. But by means of this cunning, some of the saints contrived not only to be misunderstood, but to be mistaken for very ordinary people. The Curie of Ars, for example, showed an astonishing craftiness in keeping his pot of stale potatoes out of sight. When he cured the sick, he always blamed St. Philomena. Carno Capitolato says of St. Philip Neri, veiled his miracles with a jest. Certainly, he seems to have been incessantly occupied in throwing his admirers off the scent. It is related of St. Elizabeth of Hungary that when she sat at meals with her husband, the Landgrave, she concealed the fact that she was eating next to nothing by talking with the guests, by carving the joint, by sending for the maids, by changing the plates, and by a thousand other artifices. St. Marcion the Anchorite spent the greater part of his life in dodging admiration. Indeed, in this respect he bears off the palm, because he, before he died he gave strict orders that his body was to be buried in a secret place. The saints did good by stealth and blushed to find it fame. They were well instructed in the school of that divine master who said, When thou dost an alms deed, sound not a trumpet before thee. When ye pray, pray in secret. And when you fast, be not sad, but anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou may appear not to, to men to fast. And in many cases they led their contemporaries astray by this means of their happiness and cheerfulness. This indeed will never be very difficult as long as the stupid world refuses to believe that a man who eats once a day, sleeps three hours out of twenty-four, and wears a hair shirt, can be a cheerful man. The saints were filled with the cheerful spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of bondage and fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. God, through the prophet Ezekiel, sternly reprimanded the false teachers of Israel, because with lies you have made the heart of the just to mourn, whom I have not made sorrowful. And so St. Vincent de Paul bade Mille le Grasse, Blessed Louis Marillac, honor our Lord's cheerfulness. So too St. Francis of Assisi, unto the enemy, indeed, it pertains to be sorrowful, but unto us to rejoice always. In fact, we cannot but envy the cool facility with which these saints literally sent melancholy flying to the devil, to whom they maintain it properly belongs. St. Teresa was quite emphatic on the point. St. Clement Hofbauer used the phraseology of his day, called depression the vapors, but he added the vapors of hell. I am never sad, said Venerable Father Passerat, and I thank God for it, for it is the attribute of demons. St. Philip Neri, in the plans he made for the welfare of his boys, associated merriment with the avoidance of sins, and they would not tolerate a lack of good cheer in those with whom they came in contact. The mirror of reflection tells us that it did irk the blessed Francis to see sadness in the face. On one occasion, he composed some verses and had them set to music in order to cheer up the poor Clares. My sons, St. Philip Neri was fond of saying, be cheerful. I will have no low spirits. I will have no scruples and sadness in my house. Indeed, he feared much more the harm from melancholy than from merriment. He never checked the boisterousness of his young man. When people complained of the noise which which they made, he would say, Let them grumble as much as they please, and do you make as much noise as you please. He himself loved to watch their sports and horseplay, and when he was asked how he could put up with it, he said that he would allow them to chop firewood on his back if it would keep them out of mischief. He would make his depressed penitent sing. To a worried priest who consulted him, he said, Come now, let us run a race. And so they did hand in hand. Of the saint himself, one of his biographer writes, cheerfulness flowed from his good, simple, frank nature. We find him always sprightly and happy. Even the strictest and most aesthetical saints had their relaxations and their recreations. This is one of the rights of human nature which is not to be denied. 
we find St. Charles Borromeo enjoying his game of chess, and St. Aloysius enjoying his game of ball. The common recreation of her nuns used to fall flat when St. Teresa was not present. We find them, in fact, going up to her cell and coaxing her to come down, and it is recorded, she came, and we were very merry together. St. Alphonsus could not stand moroseness and frowns at recreation. It is better, he said, to say silly things than to be silent. St. Madeline Sophie had occasion once to admonish a novice who was rather wanting in gravity, but she added, Be always happy and at recreation. In their dealings with souls, they took the cheerful and optimistic way. St. Francis de Sales insisted on using honey instead of vinegar for catching his flies. Reverence is good, but confidence is better, said St. Thomas Aquinas. We must be more kind than just, said St. John Chrysostom, adding, Kindness alone conciliates. If there must be an extreme, let it always lean towards our Lord's way of acting. You will gain nothing by command. Thus, St. Madeline Sophie, you will accomplish nothing against the stream, said St. Teresa, and St. Francis de Sales, it is better to have to account for too little severity than for too much. Indeed, his cheerful broad-mindedness was such that one of his friends said of him, Francis de Sales will go to heaven, but I am not so sure of the Bishop of Geneva. The mirror of perfection, says of St. Francis of Assisi, his highest and chiefest study was to maintain both outwardly and inwardly a spiritual cheerfulness. Perhaps we have not understood this sufficiently, that good cheer is a knack, an art in fact, that the result of much planning and contriving. People say, you are either cheerful or you are not, and that is the end of the matter. But of course, the same sort of people also say, you either love or you do not, and that is the end of that matter. Some effort must be made to preserve cheerfulness as to preserve friendship and love. Love commonly dies of sheer and willful neglect. We guard it with less care than we guard our trinkets and silver spoons, and although children are cheerful by nature and by accident, we adults are not. Good cheer flows through the little one like the blood through its veins, but it is far otherwise with us who have said goodbye to illusions and whose blood and veins are not what they were. Beauty may be able to look after herself, but not cheerfulness. A modern book has been written on The Conquest of Happiness. Whatever the merits or demerits of the book, there is a great deal of truth underlying its title. We have to make some effort to cheer up, just as we must employ a certain amount of imagination in the service of charity, so we must employ some strategy in the service of cheerfulness. How ingenious St. Teresa was in this way! There is no such thing as bad weather. All weather is good, because it is God's. And again, it comforts me to hear the clock strike, for I feel that I have drawn a little nearer to God. This is, at any rate, an improvement on the philosophy of the lady of the world who, when she was told to cheer up, because tomorrow was the longest day, replied, that means that it is only six months to the shortest. Addison tells us of the strategy of a sick man who, when he had gout, thanked God that it was not influenza, and when he had influenza, thanked God that it was not gout. When Fenelon's library was burned, he thanked God that it was not the house of a poor man, and when the Irishman was told that his house was on fire, he said, What do I care? I'm only the tenant. And we find a great deal of this common sense philosophy in the saints. To her dejected nun, St. Teresa would say, Come, come, we are not yet on the rack or amongst the moors. St. Paul reproved the cowardice of the Hebrews by reminding them that they had not yet resisted unto blood. When Father Damien discovered the symptoms of leprosy on his own person, he said, Well, at any rate, in future when I preach, instead of saying, My dear brethren, I shall be able to say, My fellow lepers. When the enemies of St. Remedius set fire to his haystacks, he and his friends, on being notified of the fact, galloped to the place in order, if possible, to save the stacks. When they arrived, they found the fire quite out of control. Well, at least, said the saint, let us warm ourselves. Fire is always good. 
Things may go wrong with us, but they can never go all wrong. No trial is ever as bad as it can be. Good and bad fortune have their innings, and if we do not lose our heads over the first, we shall not lose our peace over the second. The stars go into hiding from time to time, but they are always in their place, and sooner or later they peep out again, more welcome than ever. Hope likes the sunshine, but hides from the rain. What can't be cured must be endured. Perhaps if we had fewer desires, we should have fewer disappointments. If the events of life do not come up to our expectations, it may be that our expectations are at fault. Sweet are the uses of adversity, and the value of adversity lies in this that it dispels our illusions, opens our eyes to the realities of life, makes us realize that one alone is perfect and unchanging, and that, as a saint says, it is only in heaven that there are no misunderstandings. Such reflections are not a blind deception or self-hypnotism. They are the ingredients of what St. Francis of Assisi called the study and St. Francis de Sales called the strategy of Christian cheerfulness. Chapter 5 The Playfulness of the Saints That a saint may be frolicsome without prejudice to his prospects of canonization was settled once for all by St. Philip Neri. Cardinal Capacciaratro, speaking of his extraordinary sprightliness, says, I know of no other saint who resembles him in this respect. St. Philip's singularity lies not in the fact that he allowed great liberty to the playfulness of his disposition, but rather in this, that he made it one of the leading principles of his school of piety. He turned playfulness into a kind of apostolate. The municipality of Rome in the year 1898 set up a tablet on the Janculian Hill with the following inscription. Here in the shade of this oak tree, Philip Neri, amid the merry shouts of boys, became himself a boy again, most wisely. Priest though he was and old, he would join in the sports of those boys of his. When the game of tennis or quotas was in full swing, he would withdraw to the shelter of the tree in order to say his prayers. If the boys called him back, he would return to the field. He even allowed his young followers to play tennis against the wall of his room, and although the occupants of the house complained of the din, he would never permit the lads to be interfered with. All this, and much more of the nature, is true of St. Philip, but it is matched by what we read of in the lives of other saints. St. Don Bosco also thoroughly enjoyed a game with his boys. St. Charles Borromeo was very fond of chess, and St. Aloysius played some ball game or other. The one, during his game of chess, and the other, during his game of ball, was asked what he would do if he were suddenly told that the world was about to come to an end, and both maintained that they would go on with the game. Of St. Ignatius it is related that being anxious to do something for the soul of a certain doctor of theology, he challenged him to a game of billiards, and worse still, did it for a wager. If I win, I shall become your servant for a month. If I lose, then you will undertake to do one thing for me, which will be entirely to your own advantage. Done. The game was played, the doctor of theology lost, and he was put through the exercises for a month. So that St. Philip Neri is not by any means the only saint who was fond of games. He is the saint of playfulness because he employed it for the sanctification of his own soul and that of his disciples. He knew that if he had a reputation for sanctity, and in order to discredit it, he set himself to dance like a gypsy in the streets and public squares. Sometimes he would walk through the town carrying in his hand a branch of wild broom which he would smell with the tremendous gusto. He would go into the churches with his bereta cocked at a naughty angle, and wearing over his cassock an old jacket turned outside in. He would shave off only half of his beard. When cardinals and other great people came to see him, he would skip about in a waggish fashion and laugh as though he had lost his wits. Meeting in the crowded street a mendicant friar on his rounds, he insisted on having a pull at one of the little barrels of wine which he carried, and to the astonishment of the bystanders he pretended to be drinking with unrestrained relish. A lady, who had a great opinion of his sanctity, asked him one day how long it was since he left the world. 
Left the world, he answered. I don't know how that I have left it at all. Then turning to one of his companions, Antonio, he said, do I not still take pleasure in pretty books and poetry and novels? The tricks that he and St. Felix played on one another kept the whole of Rome laughing. When they met in the street, Felix would say, let's see what kind of mortified man you are. And then, taking a bottle from his wallet, he would make Philip drink out of it in the sight of all the people. Then it would be Philip's turn. Come, let us see what kind of border-fed man you are. And he would put his hat on the top of Friar's hood, adding, Be off now. Felix would go on his way, followed by crowds of delighted children laughing and saying, Look at Fra Felix with a hat on. Come and see it. Frater Felix with a hat on. St. Philip, in fact, mortified his penitence by means of practical jokes. He would send one walking through the streets with a sandwich board about his neck, with something absurd written on it. Another, he would order to carry an unwieldy dog in his arms, but surely the most unfortunate of all was he who, at a very grand marriage feast, was called upon to sing the Miserere in the presence of the bride and the bridegroom by way of an epithalium. And what an amount of fun St. Philip got out of his cat, and no doubt the cat out of him. Indeed, like Montaigne and his cat, it is not easy to decide which of the two provided the sport and which enjoyed it. When grand people came to see him, he would receive them with the cat curled up in his lap. When he went to live at Valencia, he left his cat behind partly, no doubt, because he knew that it would be sure to return to its old home. In that respect, the cats of the saints are no exception to the rule of their kind. But he had another motive. His biographer tells us that he would bid now one, now another of his disciples, often men of high rank or of great learning, take the key and go to San Girolamo to see how the cat was, to take her some food, and to bring back word whether she was comfortable and contented. On their return he would ask, even in the presence of cardinals, Well, so have you been to see my dear cat? What nice dinner did you take her? Is she well? Did she look happy? Had she a good appetite? Such was St. Philip Neri. In this respect, certainly, he has never been surpassed. But still, we find a great deal of his spirit in other saints. St. Thomas More and he would have made a real pair. It is well known that the martyr's household resembled a nursery full of happy children, and it did so largely owing to his inveterate love of practical jokes. Indeed, he played one upon his first wife on the very day that they were married, by presenting her with more splendid-looking jewels, which, however, were made of glass. She was delighted, of course, and she did not learn the truth about them until long after, when, no doubt, she laughed heartily at her own expense. He played his last practical joke on the eve of his execution. Henry, we are told, was most anxious that Moore should recant, and he sent a courier again and again to urge him to change his mind. Yes, I have changed my mind, said Thomas at last. The courier therefore rushed back to tell Henry. He was then told to return and find out the particulars of the change of mind. I have changed my mind in this sense, said the martyr, that whereas yesterday I intended being shaved before execution, I have now changed my mind and intend that my beard shall go with my head. St. Teresa of Avila had a great deal of this quality in her temperament. Her letters abound in sportive sallies. In one, to Antonio Gaydon, she inquires after his daughter, Let me know how you found your naughty little pickle. She got great fun out of arranging a competition between the friars and the nuns. True, it was a competition to see which of them could bear the most vexations, but it was nevertheless, what she called it, a real tournament, and no doubt they all entered wholeheartedly into the spirit of the game. The Bishop Belly tells us that at the table of St. Francis de Sales was one of the guests proposed the good old conundrum associated with the name of Columbus. The saint was very interested, and when the egg was triumphantly balanced on the plate, he had some very shrewd remarks to make about it. As bishop, he was compelled to begin a campaign against the abuses connected with St. Valentine's Day. Certainly, he resorted to very strong measures, even invoking the aid of the civil authorities. 
but both the gentleness and playfulness of his character are seen in the expedient way which he finally hit upon in order to preserve the good name and the custom. In future, I myself am going to provide you with valentines, he told his people from the pulpit, and sure enough he sent around to every family tickets bearing the names of different saints and embellished with appropriate texts from scripture and the writings of the fathers. These tickets had to be drawn for by lot, and the saint on the ticket became the patron for the year. No doubt, the people of Ansi enjoyed their lottery immensely. We have already seen St. Ignatius as a billiard player. There is another incident in his life which, as Francis Thomas says, we value as much as the record of his visions and sublimities because it helps us to keep in touch with his humanity. This lofty and aesthetic saint forgot to forget his own happy and cavalier youth. He danced before Oritz, one of his penitents. He danced as another David. He danced the old Basque national dance. Oritz was roused and brightened. The two, one may well think, laughed heartily together. There is a charming southern atmosphere about the tale. An English saint might perhaps have sung, if an English saint chanced to be capable of singing. But perhaps no man of north could so far have forgotten his constitutional gravity as to dance. This happened in 1539. Ten years before, we find dancing in full swing in a convent of poor Clares. An account of the celebration of the Jubilee of the Abbess of Nuremberg, written by one of the nuns, we read, We conducted the Reverend Mother to the refectory, and because of the occasion she allowed all the sisters to sing as much as they please. Towards the evening, we all danced, and Mother Apollina, who has been here fifty-seven years, danced with me, and in the most sprightingly manner. What the dance was, we are not told, something more stately and dignified than our dances, we may be sure, but this scene would have rejoiced the heart of St. Francis of Assisi. He was fond of doing a little dancing on his own account, and although he made no provision for it in the directions he gave to his spiritual sons and daughters, singing he strongly insisted upon. And we have good reason to believe that he had been presented at Nuremberg Jubilee, he might have improvised a kind of mimic orchestra. At any rate, the mere perfection tells us, drunken with the love that blessed Francis would at times do such like things as this. He would pick up a stick from the ground, and setting it upon his shoulder, would draw another stick athwart, the same as athwart of viola, or another instrument, and making fitting gestures would sing in the French tongue. Doubtless a theory of sainted playfulness made out of such scanty materials is not a very convincing theory, but we must remind ourselves once again that biographers have not always concerned themselves with the human side of their subjects. The monuments of many of the saints are like the monuments of Babylon or Egypt. Very little detail survives. We have the great monoliths of the temples, and we have the massive stones of the pyramid, but it is only after long and painstaking excavation that we light upon some strong evidences of the domestic life of those periods. When we do, as in the case of Pompeii, we are delighted, really instructed as to the actual life led by those ancient peoples, who, after all, must have been men and women like ourselves. It is the straw which shows how the wind blows, and so it is with the saints, Hidden away in a footnote, we often come across what amounts to a great revelation, and reading between the lines we may discover what the lines themselves do not tell us. If, says Cardinal Capitolatro, we study the saints somewhat beneath the surface, then each puts on his own special form, and this form seems more human, more kin to ourselves. Surely the puns of St. Augustine are some evidence of the playfulness of St. Augustine. The conversion of England and is closely connected with a pun, the pun of St. Gregory, non angli sed angli, and so on. From the letters that passed between St. Gregory Nazianzen and St. Basil, we learn that at least these two of the greatest and most learned doctors of the church were very playful men. They were very fast friends, at any rate, for a time, and at the height of their attachment, St. Gregory was very anxious that St. Basil should come to live beside him. Tabernia was the place suggested. Basil goes to look at Tabernia and finds it a dull and cheerless spot and writes to say so. 
Thereupon Gregory replies, There is no use blaming me for the ice and cold of Turbrinia. What a clean-footed, tiptoeing, cap-hearing man you are, to be sure. The fact is, you have set up to be a dandy. Therefore, say not a word more against our mud. If you do, I will match your waiting with your trading and all the other wretched things that are to be found in towns. That is the letter of a saint, and it is a very playful letter. Its theme is the good old standby of all amateur debating societies, town versus country. When St. Robert Bellarmine paid his first visit to a gentleman who was a great admirer of his, he tried, he did not succeed, to play a trick upon him by pretending to be someone else. It is a small incident in the splendid career of the saint, but it is sufficient evidence of his playfulness. Amongst the friends of St. Clement Hofbeier, there was a well-known pantheist whom he was very anxious to convert. Finding him one day confined to a sickbed, the saint pined to the coverlet a strap of paper on which he had written, A piece of the divinity is ill. This is the playfulness of St. Clement. There was a great deal of fun and frolic mingled with the simplicity of the curie of ours. It is well known that he has countersigned the petition organized for his removal from ours. Now that they have my signature, there ought to be no lack of material for a conviction. The first thing he did on being made a canon was to sell his Mosetta. I have sold it for fifty francs, he wrote the bishop. The price completely satisfied me. During the campaign which he conducted against what he considered improper stylishness of female fashions, he met Jean Lardret, whom when he was walking in the village, Jean was wearing the very latest thing in collars, and we may be sure was feeling and looking rather proud of the fact. The eagle eye of the curie fell upon the collar. Jean, will you sell me that collar? I will give you five souls for it. But what for, Monsieur le Cure? For my cat. Don Bosco was as much misunderstood in his day as was the good Curry of ours. Some very good people, in fact, was quite convinced that he was mad. Two priests, therefore, undertook to get him safely lodged under lock and key in the neighborhood lunatic asylum. It would require a great deal of tact and coaxing, but they would manage it between them. It takes one priest to understand and to manage another, etc., etc. Don Bosco received them very graciously, and having soon smelled a rat, he determined to nip it in the bud. He therefore agreed to accompany them to the carriage which was waiting outside. After you, said he, and then when the priest had got in, to the coachman, to the asylum, and he slammed the door. This was the playfulness of Don Bosco. Perhaps if the truth were known, there was a playful side to the characters even of the great aesthetics. Sozaman, the church historian, calls the hermetical life the peak of philosophy. But the genuine philosopher is a very complete man whose eyes are wide open, both to the serious side of life and to the funny side. Democritus was called the laughing philosopher. He laughed a little more than the average philosopher, but every real philosopher laughs. Therefore, from time to time, at any rate, on feast days, there may have been a certain liveliness in the Loras and hermitages of the Theobad, and who knows what tricks the Stylites and the Gorovagi may have played on one another. The monk who was ordered to unpick each evening the baskets he had made during the day may have thought it would be a very good joke, and perhaps it was intended to be. At any rate, there is tucked away in the corner of the lies of the fathers of the deserts one little incident which is something in the nature of an illumination. There was, we are told, a novice who had a high reputation for virtue even amongst the old and experienced solitaries. One of the latter, wishing to test the patience of the young man, entered the enclosure of his cell and so utterly destroyed the garden of herbs which he had taken so much pain to lay out that only one single plant was left standing. Meantime, the signal for the office was sounded and dinner followed as a matter of course. Since the old monk had not left the garden, Charity demanded that he should be invited to share the repast of the young novice. Venerable father, he said, sit down and I will prepare for you a dinner consisting of the herb which fortunately you have spared me. Amongst the promises which God made to Zacharias was this, I shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem 
and the city shall be full of boys and girls playing in the streets thereof. According to commentators, these promises are fully verified only in the church, in that church which is the fruitful mother of saints.